it uh, to use uh, a good architect because there was a really nice modernist hospital that they wanted to demolish, which of course burnt down halfway through the process. And they said they could replace it if they used architects who were going to push the boat a little. So we then designed these very modernist houses, which are all based around a really tight layout, doors to the north, uh, and back gardens to the south. It's a south facing slope. Everybody gets a view of the Pentlands, everybody gets sunshine into their garden, everybody gets a wee muse close or cul-de-sac where you meet your neighbours. Meet Johnny from here, meet Jimmy from there on their tricycles. The whole development gets a village green out the front, which is big enough for a football pitch or to play cricket on, and it gets two sets of trees here to build tree houses in, etc. Now these houses sold for as much as the standard ditty boxes with trellising and, and pediments and things like that there, but these are now selling for exactly the same as they were sold by, and these are now going for from 85 to 100,000 more than they were sold for originally. Plus, they're twice as dense as here. And we all know that the nature of a city is density, but the nature of a good city like Edinburgh <coughs> is density with amenity. The denser you get a development, the closer the shops are, the closer the buses, the closer the school is, the more walkable it is. Um, so if we can make, if our developers can make more money building those, and the city is more denser doing something like this, this seems to be to be exactly the way forward. Here, there's no room to play, to, to do anything in the garden. Most of the gardens are overshadowed. You never see anything. So to me, that's the way forward. And I'm doing a wee study with Homes for Scotland, Emory University, and somebody else on why the housing market should be doing this instead of wanting to go back to the standard ditty boxes. How many homes are there, Martin? Um, 36, something like that. But we're working with the council now, and I'll come, uh, I'll come back on to that because we're looking at further stuff with you mm -hmm. um, elsewhere in town. Sorry, Martin. Yes. But when you attention to the being on the planning committee, of course, this is something that objections all the time too yeah. much density. Curious what you mean by credit density and then it makes it sort of closer to amenities. Can you yeah. explain that? Well, this here you have, I don't know, 30 homes per hectare. So 30 homes per hectare, um, you would take 40 hectares to justify a corner shop. Here you have twice that, so you have half the amount to justify the corner shop. So the corner shop goes bust. If you do, if you if you do this, the corner shop can can live, can be supported. The library can be supported. If you have more homes there, then you can walk to the library. You can walk to local facilities. People don't have to get in a car to go to the shops. It's what works in cities, and what we don't do enough about. It's a real interesting issue. The word density sounds bad because you immediately think of Platinum Point, which will come up later. But what I always talk about density with amenity. If you can get a layout where people have a south-facing garden, a relationship to their neighbours, uh, and social space, open space here, and if you can do it in a way that's denser than this neighbourhood, which has none of that, that's a good thing. But if it's just sticking them as high as possible and getting as many cars around them as possible, then that's so good density and bad density, but not an important point. Um, Ricardo mentioned. Well, maybe I mentioned advocacy, but you mentioned sort of talking up for my city. And I do like the fact that um, the things that I've done here, and excuse me if this is if this is rude, I've seen many, and not necessarily from the council, from uh, the Scottish Development Agency, from SEAL, from Leo, from all these whatever, I've seen art strategies come and go for Edinburgh, and I've seen consultants being paid lots of money and uh, being told that, Yes, it has to be an arts quarter on the Cowgate or the West End of Princess Street. Nothing comes from it except a big report. I'm quite surprised that just by going about my business and knowing my town well and knowing arts people and working with the lottery and with council cooperation, that work I've done just in a simple way, to me, that's just that. Edinburgh on the back of, uh, uh, not on the back of, but as when the application went to UNESCO, for it to be the first World City of Literature, and the first two items on it were, this is the world's first poetry library, national poetry library, 
This is the world's first national storytelling centre. We think too often that we have to be, you know, what does Bilbao do? What does Barcelona do? How do all these people do these things better? Can we catch, can we, oh, can we catch, can we catch their coattails? Can we get a bit of that glamour? There are things that we can do here with the specialness of the place and the culture of the place, which actually are worth celebrating and other people have recognised. Dan Space, Cindy and I wrote the brief. We did it, it just seemed like a good thing to do. And that has actually been the model for every regional dance centre in Britain thereafter. They've all come along and seen what dance space has done there and wanted some of that. I've talked about what the Dovecot's done too. So I kind of reversed into it. I'm very proud that through that, working, knowing these arts organisations, knowing my place, working in that place, I think these are really significant things for Edinburgh. And I talk a lot about the, the eco town and how it goes wrong. If we think that as in Nairnshire and as in Ballater, that building uh, um, communities on greenfield sites, whether they have um, free bikes, no UPVC, etc., is neither here nor there. Whether they look like Granny's Heel and Game is neither here nor there. <laughs> if they are being built on farmland, they are not eco towns. <laughs> they are car dependent suburbs that look a little bit like uh, old towns. This, excuse me, many of you have heard this many times. This is the best eco town in Britain. It's the best eco town in Scotland. All existing communities are eco towns. This is fabulous. It's even got a mountain in the middle of it for people to see. And making this work, which I understand without thinking of all my life, all my working life, um, I've been making this city, trying to make this city more civil and more civic, easier to walk around, more cultured thinking about what's important about it. And I think we all need to try, we all need to try and do that. What's wonderful about the city? Well, here's my house, here's my workplace. I go in to work along here, to go through the meadows. And it's just lovely because in the morning, I leave the house all tense because there's been porridge being thrown about at home. And I get to work and there's the, there's the work equivalent of porridge being thrown about. But the fact I have this down, down uh, uh, through the links on the way absolutely calms me, makes me feel good. Um, I've told the story before, but I met a guy who was at school with, hadn't seen him for 30 years. His first question to me was, <coughs> so Fraser, what's your commute like? I said, oh, uh, whatever, it's a 10 minute cycle through the middles. And he said, bloody green nonsense. <laughs> so, <laughs> that was really weird. And I thought, well, you know, it's, it's Faster, it's cheaper, um, yes, it doesn't you use it less than the world's resources and it keeps you fit. But at the end of the day, it's actually about it's actually about you know meeting people and seeing the sunshine and feeling calm and that's what Edinburgh does. By the time I get to work every morning I've met at least three or four people in the morning. Some of them will tell me things that are good for me in business. That's what the city does well. So when I see this, um, my blood boils and I desperately would like to Make, make everyone in the council who's to look after the city understand this is fundamentally damaging to Edinburgh. The fact that the, the Chief Plan of Scotland um, introduced this to me is a disgrace. It's against all planning policy. It's about putting an enormous new town on the uh, out past the ring road on Greenbelt. And its basic premise, as shown here, is to soak money out of town to where it can be easier done by house builders, etc. There's no VAT on this. There's VAT, of course, there's VAT on uh, doing up buildings, the sort of work I do here. Um, and uh, I, I did, I had a big, well, not public spat, uh, but I wrote this in the Scotsman, and Andres Duaney, the master planner, did a presentation, and he put this up. He talked for half his presentation. He said, I agree, I agree with everything you say, Malcolm, which, as I was saying, uh, um, he was destroying my city, I found rather strange, and the only reason he had for why this had to be done is he said, you cannot build family homes in the city. Now, as I was being brought up in a family home in the city, and as Edinburgh definitively has this whole issue of amenity and, uh, and density, I thought this was probably the most evil urban thing anyone had ever said. He's American. He has this view of the city.